a deep dive into the past with Jerry McGovern. I'm Andrea Sigritz of the TTS office in GSA, and I'm super excited we're bringing you this event today. In researching this event, I realized the last time we tackled this was in 2010, so it's long overdue. And with the passage of the Connected Government Act, which focuses on the mobile friendliness of government websites, it's a great time to redouble our efforts around top tasks and make sure our customers get what they need from government. There are just a couple of things that our friends from DigiGov University want us to be aware of before we get started. We'll take questions at the end of the presentation and you can type those into the YouTube chat box, which is to the right of the video. We're recording today's session and it will be available immediately on the DigitalGov YouTube channel. You'll also receive an email immediately after the event with the slides and an event evaluation. Please give us your feedback since it helps us to make sure we're creating content that you can find valuable. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Jerry McGovern. Jerry is a widely regarded expert on digital customer experience. Over the years, he has spoken and consulted on this topic in more than 35 countries, including the governments of Canada, the UK, and the United States. We are so lucky to have him with us today. So now I'd like to turn it over to him. Jerry? Thank you very much, Andrea. Very happy uh, to be here. And uh, I'm just gonna share my screen and uh, we'll, we'll get going with the actual uh, presentation. So is are we seeing the screen, Andrea? Yes. Okay, good stuff. So, um, a deep dive into top tasks. What is a driver of, of whether it's citizen experience or customer experience over the last 20 years? What have really the top organizations and governments uh, focused on? Um, they focused on essentially two things, helping people do stuff. Uh, so helping people get their, their services uh, online, but really where excellence has occurred is doing stuff quickly. Uh, in getting getting people to do stuff really really fast, focusing on on citizen time, not so much organization time. And there's a lot of studies out there that have analysed how people behave in an online environment. And it said that at about 100 milliseconds, uh, we notice delays. So delays of 100 milliseconds, which is only one tenth of a second, we, we begin to notice those sorts of of actual delays. And certainly at a second. We are, we are very aware. So subconsciously, we're aware at 100 milliseconds. Uh, consciously, we become aware at, at uh, one second. And certainly, if, if a delay is more than three seconds, uh, we're significantly annoyed in the process. And the way that Google thinks and the way that Amazon thinks, they don't think in, in seconds. They think in milliseconds. They're focused on shaving hundreds of milliseconds uh, of either downloads of pages or readability or whatever it is that's, that's in that performance environment. So in that world, you know, and as Andrea mentioned, the, the smartphone and the mobile uh, environment, if, if people are impatient on a desktop, they are 10 times more impatient uh, on a mobile or um, a, a smartphone. Oftentimes the bandwidth isn't as, uh, as good wherever they are in the, the Wi-Fi, the screen is smaller, they're on the move. You know, people tend to have much shorter, uh, much more frequent uh, interactions uh, with a smartphone, but of, of a much shorter duration. And as we can see here from, from this chart, uh, from uh, Luke uh, Robuski, uh, Smartphones are taking over the world. You know, the, the absolute growth in these smaller screen environments is, is exploding uh, uh, around the world. So if we're not really designing for and understanding these environments, we are not part of, of the present and part of the future. So mobile, as I indicated, a lot of short uh, interactions, 80 plus a day on average, uh, uh, people log in and for a, an average of around 30 seconds or less. So they're they're doing short, often micro elements of tasks, a quick burst, try and get something, go away, do do something else. And what's their, their, their biggest issue? 46% way ahead uh, saying slow, pages slow uh, uh, to load. But it, when you think of it, uh, the loading page is only 
20% of the overall customer experience. What is 80% of the customer experience is what happens when you get the page downloaded. Is the page slow to read? Do we have to uh, browse and, 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 and go down loads and loads of screens before we can find what we're looking for? So time is not simply a technical element of performance. So it's not simply about getting the page down. It's what type of page actually arrives. Uh, is it useful? Is it fast? Is it is it slim? Is it to the point? Is uh, you know is there the minimum amount of text on it? Because as you should be reducing weight of uh, the technical weight of a page to download, you should be reducing the word weight. Uh, and the image weight, the, the amount of images and the amount of words that are necessary to make the communication. So people driven by time and impatience, and it's their biggest frustration. Uh, it, it was the biggest frustration on desktop, and it's 10 times bigger on mobile. So if we're designing for mobile, we're designing for the super impatient person. On desktop, we're just uh, designing for the impatient person on uh, mobile we're designing for the super impatient person so a model of management if we were how do we know we're getting better how do we know know we're doing a good job uh, how do we know we're serving our citizens you know that we're delivering great services to them well here's a model that we've been working with a good bit over the last couple of years or last five to ten years in 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 canada about measuring tasks over time core important tasks that people need to do so we got here passport getting a new passport a major task in every country so then we break up and, and create a, a a discrete set of examples of, of getting a passport what are the key steps in that and one of the steps is often finding a, a local passport service location where you can drop off your details and uh, the, the, uh, as necessary. So in spring 2014, that had a 93% success rate. So Canadian government was measuring the ability of their citizens to find the nearest passport service location. And by giving them that task on the web and saying, oh, uh, find your nearest passport service location. And in spring 2014, that had a 93% success rate, which which was uh, is a very good success rate. But by summer 2015, it had dropped to a 53% success rate. So they're measuring the same task over time, find a passport service location. And this is a key element of, of managing these environments that you measure the same task over time. And then you can know if your environment is getting better or not, if it's easier or not for the customer. So something went wrong here. What went wrong? Well, we'll find out in a minute. Uh, but whatever went wrong was fixed. And then by spring uh, 2016, it went up to uh, basically 100% uh, success rate again. So what actually happened? Well. The failure rate was caused by them adding this interactive map, which senior management thought was really cool because this shows how many passport service locations we have all over Canada. Isn't that wonderful? That's great. And look at all the red and the blues and the pins. And it looks really cool. But people were confused by it. All they wanted was their local passport service location. I mean, you're not going to be in Quebec and say, oh, look, there's this passport service location in, in Vancouver, I think I'll, I'll drive for three weeks uh, to get to that uh, place. Or maybe I'll hitch a, a, a ride with the ice road truckers and uh, go to Jackknife and leave in my passport stuff up, up there. You know, people aren't lucky. They're not interested in that. What the, what the solution was, was basically a search box, not a, a cool interactive map, just a basic search box which allowed you put in your zip code or put in the local town and bang, you got what you needed for. Uh, uh, you got just one address that told you, here's your nearest passport service location. Now, this is what happens when you're measuring the task over time. You know if you're getting better or not. How do you know your services are improving, whether that's on mobile or on desktop in the environment? It's a crucial question. And one of the ways to do it is to consistently measure the same tasks over time. So I'll give some exa more examples here happening in Canada. Weather alert, success rate. Uh, went from 25% uh, in, in one stage up to 75% uh, success. So they were measuring the same, uh, how do you get, how do people get weather alerts? 
And one of the key impacts on this, and this was in, in uh, a mobile uh, tested environment, is that this was the original one, uh, severe thunderstorm um, watch in, in effect. Yeah, so to get the full alert, this people were supposed to click on this, but they didn't think it was a link. And when they just added underline and a little bit uh, a, a details added, it went from 25% to 75%. Sometimes it's a very small change that drives a very significant improvement in the environment. But because they were measuring the same task over time, they could do stuff, see if it was working, uh, make changes, uh, measure again and say, oh, that worked. You know, and sometimes it's simple changes can drive big positive uh, effects within the environment. So hourly forecasts. Uh, only 19% of people on, on mobile were able to get uh, the appropriate hourly forecast. After the changes, it, it went up to 94%. So why was that? Well, essentially, uh, in the desktop, uh, it wasn't that far down the screen, but when, once it went in mobile, the actual hourly forecast went way down. You had to scroll ages to actually get down to the hourly forecast. And in the changed environment, they moved the hourly forecast up much further, uh, closer to the top, and the success rate went from 19% to 94% uh, in, in the process. So basically constantly measuring the experience of real people giving real people, real Canadian citizens, real tasks of find your hourly uh, forecast and measuring that over time and making changes. That's the model uh, that the best governments in the world, uh, gov.uk, et cetera, are, are using to manage their environments. So name your business success rate this in a business area before uh, checking a database of did, does your business already exist? It was only 55% success rate after it was 94% success rate. So what happened? Well, the system was called Nuance, N-U-A-N-S, some sort of a technical acronym type of person. that Not very many people really understood. Uh, and when they just changed it to search Canadian corporate names, it went from 55% to 94%. So it's often simple changes that have very significant impacts on uh, the behavior and the success rate. But if we're not measuring these, we don't know if we're getting better or not. So in a, a top quality environment, we are constantly measuring the actual behavior of real customers trying to do real tasks on our websites. The data, the data and analytics is simply not enough if you want to deliver quality. If you're managing in, uh, in Amazon or Netflix or whatever, they do not simply depend on their data and analytics. They combine it with observational based data of real people, whether it's in A-B testing or in, in uh, monitored and controlled, uh, and, and precisely run usability tests of measuring the same stuff over time to see are the changes they're making uh, creating a, an impact. And of course, this is the culture that has driven gov.uk, a culture of continuous improvement, that it's always a hypothesis. It's an alpha, it's a beta. We're always testing. We're never there. We're never done. We're always continuously improving. But how can you continuously improve if you've got 10,000 pages uh, and, and you've got two staff? Uh, the, the best organizations have much less content that they manage much better rather than being these huge storehouses or dumping grounds of, of, of content. If we're going to do this environment, if we're going to do digital well, it's a continuous improvement uh, environment where you're constantly improving the performance of your citizens and businesses' top tasks. So here, you remember I said earlier about the performance and the impatience of waiting for the page to download? It's what about what about the impatience when the page actually downloads and you have to read all this sort of stuff? So this was stuff they looked at this in gov.uk and they said, how can we simplify this uh, for a citizen or, or a business? So when they looked at it, they realized that this was all the information that was needed. This was all the information that people needed to see. If you're asked to register and don't do so, you could be fined 80 pound. All of that blah, 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 blah text that nobody cares about could be simplified to one sentence that made it much easier for customers and citizens and businesses to understand what they need to do, what is the, their obligation to government in this, in this situation.
This here registers a waste carrier before 50 pages of content, one tool, one transaction. How did they simplify it? How did they save time for citizens? They just, you know, ask a few qu questions, a logic flow. Do you ever uh, deal with building construction or demolition? Yes and no. With two or three questions, they were able to get rid of 50 pages of content and loads of tools and complications. If we're really thinking about people, if we're really focused on people's time, on, on businesses' time, on citizens' time, and if we're asking the question, how do we make it easier? How do we make it faster uh, for people to do? We're going to be doing the right things. We're going to be doing the right things for mobile. We're going to be doing the right things, whatever the environment is. The core question is, how do we make it faster? How do we make it easier for people to do the things they need to do with government? Because nobody wakes up in the morning thinking, hey, Hey, I'm going to visit a, I'm really looking forward to visit a government website today. It's definitely not on anybody's bucket list. It's not in anybody's dreams of visiting a, a government website. And of course, what uh, gov.uk have found that the vast majority of, of activity uh, is connected with a relatively small set of stuff. So 90% of the, the, the top 28 uh, services, 4% account for over 90% of transactions. These are the top tasks. The, of course, there's overall top tasks in UK government and within any specific environment, they're, they're top tasks themselves. If you're going to deliver value, if you're going to continuously test, if you're going to continuously improve, which is what you need to do if you're going to deliver quality and digital, you can't continuously improve everything. So doesn't it make much more sense to continuously improve continuously monitor to test and review and iterate the the top tasks that have huge demand and have huge potential impact uh, for citizens and businesses and gov.uk struggle like everywhere else in the the old environment of the massive growth of 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 content uh, from about 3,000 pages when they launched in 2013 to, as they approached 2017, 300,000 pages. Because if you don't manage the top tasks and, and tightly control them and uh, not get focused on the tiny tasks, your content totally explodes and grows and nobody is happy. And you deliver no value to anybody because after two or three years, you have to go back to the drawing board and try and do redesigns and get rid of all the junk and start again. But if you're just in an environment where you constantly put stuff up, you're not delivering value. You may be responding to the latest senior manager's request, but it's certainly not going to deliver value to citizens and to businesses. And in a mobile, it's going to be a total nightmare for people to find anything that they need to find. Um, so to deal with these issues of content growth, the gov.uk have adopted the top task approach of really focus, 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 focus on what truly matters, what has the biggest impact, and you make sure that that's performing at 80, 90% plus success rates, and that that's uh, taking 30 or 60 seconds instead of four minutes before you do the other stuff, because that's going to have the biggest uh, bang for the buck. That's going to deliver the most value to people. Same with the European Commission following the same approach of the top task approach. And in Canada, as I said, you know, uh, the, the, uh, I was over there in February and the minister wrote a, a blog post, a minister responsible for digital, you know, saying that, you know, that nobody on their deathbed is saying, I, I wish I spent more time with government and he said it's a wake-up call for government we're not that precious nobody cares really about the content we produce they really just want to do what they need to do as quickly as possible just looking at some of the stuff uh, that's happening uh, in, in U.S. government, some of, some of the sites that I've been looking at. The, this the old IRS site. On the surface, it doesn't look bad, except where do you start? There's so much navigation on this page. It's a total spaghetti junction. File your tax, multiple uh, different environments. Then you got forms, you got hot topics. So the other topics are not so hot. It's file your tax, a hot topic. And then you got tools. What on earth is a tool? Isn't everything a tool? Is the other stuff not tools, etc.? Is apply for an EIN, etc.? Very, very confusing. Then filing. How many filing links do we have on the page? It's like where 
where's Waldo from a, a filing point of view? News, and then this section here, is this a hot topic, etc. And then we got social media. What does social media mean? There's, is somebody coming to IRS and saying, I want to watch the IRS social media. I haven't seen IRS social media in weeks. I'm so excited about looking at their Twitter account just to see what's happening. Nobody cares about your social media. You know, nobody cares about your tool. They just want to file their taxes. And this is the new environment, a vast improvement, a vast improvement, uh, much more clinical, much more focused on the core top task, stripping away, absolutely focusing. And there's no happy pictures of people filing their taxes either. They're not wasting people's time with a big useless image of people looking happy because nobody's happy when they're filing their taxes or doing most of the other stuff they need to do with government. So this, a very good, some very good progress. Here, we look at this vets.gov, it's not bad, but do, do vets need to come to this page to see pictures of themselves? Is that, are they looking for a picture gallery? Why the pictures? Why do we need these things? It's more an internal need guaranteed than it is an external need of the actual vets. So you look at this page, on, on a mobile environment and it's just a, a picture, a kind of a useless uh, picture that is of no benefit to anybody. They have to click before they can do something. However, if you actually click, the structure is great. It looks, it looks you know, really useful, disability, healthcare, healthcare, education and training, housing assistance. Why isn't that on the page? Why aren't the top three things are the top five things that uh, vets need to do with government immediately available. They don't need to see pictures of themselves. We need to get beyond this brochureware thinking and this that we're designing for some sort of a print environment and start designing for digital, start designing for to make the website a doable website rather than a website that, that is some sort of an art gallery uh, for, for the organization uh, because it's not for the customer. It's not serving the customer. So just little tweaks, a lot of good stuff happening here, but you know, the the, the old flaw of these big useless images uh, put on the pages as, as usual. So let me look here and this, here's an example of in an old school and Irish uh, health environment, but they want uh, to change it, the Irish Department of Health, uh, of, you know, pictures of of, of of people and patients that that is of no use to anybody. So they want to change. So what they did, we went out and we did a top task analysis. So we went out to citizens and we said, in dealing with your health, what's most important to you? So we went through a big process. I can't uh, explain this every step of the process here, but a big process uh, to gather all the possible tasks that people might want or need to do um, in relation to dealing with their health uh, in, in Ireland. So overall, there was something like 70, 74, 75 tasks. So we got citizens to vote. We got about 3,000 citizens to vote. And these were the top tasks. The top, the yellow is the top task. So waiting times, number one, it's a big issue in Ireland at the moment. Then number two, mental well-being. Number three, costs. Number four, screening. Number five, diagnosis, check symptoms emergencies, what to do. So this giving us a sense of what is it that really matters? So we had 74 tasks. We, how did we get these uh, list of tasks? Well, we looked at data, we looked at analytics, we looked at other health environments like the NHS in the UK. We went out and interviewed doctors and nurses and patients and tried to get an, we looked at medical literature and journals and magazines. We really tried to understand, uh, we weren't asking on the website what deal, uh, uh, what is important. We said, no, in dealing with your health, we tried to understand the area of health because the difference between digital and physical is constantly dissipating. It's, it's digital and physical are the same spaces in this day and age. And people want to deal with their health, not to deal with their health on digital or deal with their health on physical. They want to deal with their health. They want to manage their health or find out if they've got uh, challenges or check their symptoms or whatever. So we found that these seven tasks had as much of the vote as the bottom 39 tasks. So the 75 tasks were everybody thought was really important, but again, top tasks emerged in the process. 
So when you do this sort of uh, analysis and you also ask category questions and the category questions is, you know, what age is you or are, what's your gender, etc. So when you give them this big, long list of tasks and you ask them to vote on it and then you combine that with category questions, you can do very interesting analysis and that that will inform your digital strategy because if you don't know your customers how can you have a digital strategy how can you create great customer experience if you don't know what they want to experience if you don't know what it is that they want to try and do so here we can see then actually yellow are the top tasks so we see there's a lot of similarity in tasks from 18 to 64 but in 65 and over there's a bit of, there's there's some good overlap but there's certainly a difference right and in 17 and younger there's certainly a difference as well so if we look across here we see check symptoms Oh, it, it begins to decline over the, for 65 and, and over it's very low why is that well when you once you're 65 you know what you're dying from it's managing your symptoms in in the process so they're not going to be checking symptoms as much as younger people are are, are going to be doing so here if we look at the 17 year old and, and younger we can dig into this data and see uh some some interesting patterns coming through so let's see mental well-being this was an interesting thing we discovered and mental well-being was the, the number one task for people under se uh, 17 or younger. But it began to decline in importance relatively over time. So we get insight about uh, the specific groups. You combine top tasks, task data with, with uh, demographics. You get very interesting insights that are not just useful for the website or the mobile or whatever, are, are really useful in all sorts of strategies and environments. So here, then check symptoms. We see check symptoms decline over time it's a more important issue uh, for younger people it begins to decline over time and actually we did the same study in the UK 10 years earlier uh, for the NHS the National Health Service in the UK and we see the relatively same pattern occurring that check symptoms it's not quite as downward a graph but basically it declines over time as you get older uh, in in the process here, then looking at the older age group, 65 to 74, uh, what, what are you know, some reverse patterns, so to speak? What, what gets more important over time? How to use the health service by age? Less important to people who are younger, but begins to jump once you get over 55 to 64. How to use the health service? So if you were directed marketing or promotion in these areas, it's, it's much more useful, or how-to pages towards older people than towards younger people, because younger people feel more empowered, they're going to use Google, et cetera, in the process. And remember, they didn't. Uh, the older people didn't have checked symptoms as as uh, a major task, but seriousness of a condition uh, really increases as you get older. So you're getting insight. If you understand the tasks people want to do, you really have a strong insight into how to design for them, how to give them a great uh, actual experience. This is an unusual one. This is exercise, and this is a kind of a U shape. And basically, what we see is. It's important for younger people, and then it begins to decline in importance as people uh, get slightly older and move into their middle ages, and, uh, and then it begins to get important again as they get older again in the process. These sorts of insights, once you combine um, the category-based questions and your top task data, really help you understand what sort of content is needed, what do we create, what do we not need to create uh, in, in the actual process. Here, a little look at the top tasks we did for the European uh, Commission. So out of this was we had 107,000 voters in this. It was absolutely massive. It was done in 28 countries in, in 24 languages. So very, very complicated environment. And still across the entire European Union of some 400 million people, there were six tasks that really mattered. Law, research and innovation funding grants and subsidies, education and training, EU strategy, and environmental protection. These were the core tasks that really mattered to people. And we could show that even across all the countries, so remember yellow and green are the top 50%, they're the top task family. So you look across this environment and you say, hey, 
we can have a common structure in every country because the same top tasks are appearing in every country that we look across. Okay, there's a little bit of a difference in Luxembourg, but you know, aside from that, there's amazing conformity. So at Leader tell us there's differences uh, within an environment or else there's a lot of conformity and we can create a similar structure and it'll work in every country. So once we had established our top tasks uh, list and environment, we went out to all the different departments uh, that had responsibilities for these tasks. So these are all the acronyms connected with the various departments or divisions. Now there's something like 40 major departments uh, within the European Union. So they're called DGs uh, in, 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 in the European Union. And we asked them, uh, connected with this task and the list of tasks, do you have any responsibility uh, in, in the actual process? So basically we, we got them to mark and say, yeah, we create content for this. Yeah, we have some res responsibility for this. So the 77 tasks we had, every single one of them is shared uh, with at least one other DG and an average of 12 departments per task. So what does that mean? It's the next big challenge in government that that uh, governments around the world are, are, are trying to figure out. People don't know where to go. If they have to go to 12 different places to complete one task or to figure out, is this the right place? That's confusing government. That's poor service delivered from, from government. So this is what they were saying, oh, law, uh, various elements of law could be in 12 different or more different sections of or different websites or different areas, etc., uh, spread around the place. Where do people go? So the big challenge that they're working on today is to build bridges, to manage tasks, not departments, and to have a single place for law and to connect up all the law-related information from all the various areas throughout the European Commission and Union so that people get a unified experience and can go to a single place and find everything connected with law or everything connected with research and innovation for that. So a lot of bridge building going on, a lot of cross-functional collaboration collaboration going on uh, within the environment. And the UK are thinking very much along uh, the same lines. Uh, they see the same challenge. So instead of managing departments, they're seeking to manage tasks like starting a business. So they're looking at who are all the people who are all the entities and the organizations uh, throughout the UK that are connected with starting a business. So they know the uh, the Department of Revenue, Work and Pensions, there's a there's a business uh, department of business and then there's a department of education that helps with training and startup and grants and stuff like that. There's companies house that helps you set up uh, an actual company, uh, etc. There's international trade because many of these businesses will be wanting to export and trade internationally. And then depending on the area, there's food standards, there's health and safety. So they're trying to unify these and connect up and bring the, not necessarily get, you can't get rid of the silos, but you can bridge the silos and create a seamless uh, experience. So the next big challenge that the top governments in the world are looking at is creating a seamless customer experience and managing the tasks, not the actual government departments, uh, unifying the tasks and bringing all the elements of government connected with starting a business. Canada is doing the exact same thing. The real progressive governments in the world are not saying to you, you must understand government. They're instead saying, we're going to try and understand you. You're an entrepreneur. You want to set up a, a, a business and grow. We're going to give you a place that brings together all of the things that really matter to you and that uh, you can focus on starting your business rather than trying to understand how government works. So the broad principle at play, and this fits into the whole concept of top task management, really identify critically and clearly what matters most and equally what matters least because you got to uh, really defocus on what I call the tiny task. There's a top task and there's the tiny task. And when a tiny task goes to sleep at night, it dreams of being a top task. Most government websites are being smothered 
by uh, the the low level content of the tiny task that uh, may be on the agenda of a manager or whatever but are not serving uh, citizens needs so we need to show how that if we don't focus on the top tasks, we are not delivering quality service. Certainly, we're not delivering it on desktop. And unquestionably, we are not delivering it uh, in a mobile-based uh, environment where the world is increasingly going to. So identify, clearly identify those top tasks. And, and, and then uh, focus on those. Focus your energies on continuously improving those measure them on an ongoing basis, measure their performance, make changes to make them easier to find, faster to do. And you're continuously measuring and improving. So no more than about the vast majority of organizations I've worked with, and I've worked with, you know, Cisco and IBM and, and IKEA and BBC and many, many in environments. There are no more than five to 10 tasks, really important tasks in most environments. So you measure those top tasks by giving real people real examples of those tasks, and then you continuously improve and you're constantly seeking to increase that success rate. So bring that success rate up as close to 100% as possible. And then, but best practice is once you've got the success rate up high, that you're reducing the time. So last year, it used to take four minutes to, to do this task. You're saying to your team, how do we bring it down to three minutes? How do we take a minute off this task? What could we do to, to, to make it faster and easier for people to do? So identify our top tasks and continuously measure them by giving real examples of those tasks to real people and continuously uh, improving them uh, on an ongoing basis. So that's, that's the presentation. Uh, I think we can... We have time now, I believe, for, for questions or comments. So we can uh, send it back you to, to uh, Andrea and um, let, let's see if there's some questions uh, or, or feedbacks or comments coming back from the audience. Thank you so much, Barry. This was great and powerful as always. Um, and we do have a few questions, so I will get into those. But for those of you who are interested in asking something, feel free to put your question into the chat box, and then we will get it over to Jerry. So the first question that we have um, is just a question about the top task concept. Is top tasks a concept like Agile or more like a tool like Jira or TFS? And these are software development tools. Yeah. It's more a management model, Andre. It's it's more a, a, a holistic overall way of of viewing how you manage things. So it's it's meant to deal with everything, but it prioritizes the top tasks. So in the health environment, everything will be findable. It's just that costs, waiting times, you know, screening and vaccinations, they will be more prioritized. But it's a model to deal with everything. One of the big mistakes that happens is that people just create a little section on their homepage and say, these are the top tasks. You might as well not do that at all. That's like the old IRS website saying hot topics or whatever in, in the process. It's an overall approach to manage your, managing your environment where you prioritize what is the highest uh, value and highest demand. And that's uh, particularly relevant, as we said, in a mobile environment where people are even more impatient. But it's a management model. How do you measure success? You know, you measure it based on how well are your top tasks performing? Great, thank you. Um, and I do, we just got in a question. So I'm going to skip down, but I'll come back to another question we had. Um, and the last question we just received was, what's the best way to identify top tasks? Well, you know, we've developed a, a, our own method over the years, and there's there's articles that I, I can send you and links to in a list of part that, that, that details our specific methodology. But you know, but broadly, you you look at data and analytics, but that's not enough. It, that tells you 
of what is happening and sometimes if the website is badly organized or poorly structured or doesn't have the right content it won't tell you what's missing uh, in in the pro so your data your top searches yeah that gives you about 50 percent of the t the the task environment you need to uh, look at what's happening on social media what are people asking for you know what's coming in from the support desks the support uh, is, uh, and service channels are often an excellent form of, of, of issues. You look at other uh, environments uh, and you, you try and think, like the Irish Health, they didn't think on our website, they said there's stuff that they, they're doing, like uh, waiting times which come up. They can't actually do that at the moment. They don't have the systems to do that, uh, so to speak, but they know it's a huge issue, so they know you know that they can plan for that over the next two or three years. So there may be tasks that you're not immediately capable, but if you get the information that that's the number three thing that you know your businesses want to do, at least you can plan for that over time. So it's not about what you have; it's about what it's trying to get into the the customers' world and what they do. So you need a big research exercise to really understand what it is like in dealing with health or in paying your tax or et cetera. Uh, and you build together then that overall list. And essentially you ask uh, your, your target audience, your customers to vote on that, to choose the five most important things uh, to do. So you need a, a prioritization model. However you're gonna get it, you need a league table that says, here's the critical stuff. Here's the top five to 10 critical stuff. And here's the 50 to 60 stuff things that people are not that interested in. So there's always a hierarchy uh, in, in, in digital. So however you do it, you need to get that league table of importance that gets signed off and accepted throughout the organization that says, yes, this is a map of the customer experience. This is what matters most to them. This is what matters least to them. That's great. Thank you. And this earlier question, I think, um, dovetails right into that. Um, they were asking, when someone's job is to create content about a program that does not represent a top audience task, what's the best way to help them put their content in front of the audience? And this person finds that to be the single, single biggest challenge for their clients. Yeah, it's, 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 a, big, it, it's a very big challenge because, I mean, this is why government has a challenge around the world in that a, a lot of the time it's producing content that nobody wants to read you know, or that as an extremely low demand in, in the process. And that's that's a challenge government is facing in, in so many countries. And it's a challenge of legitimacy that a lot of what government produces, it almost produces to keep itself busy uh, in, in, in the process. Uh, and we need to really revisit uh, within the environment. So if, you know, it's, it's not a top task, and it's funny, I never get questions about the top tasks. I always get questions about what about the tiny tasks? I mean, nobody cares about the top tasks. No, nobody asks questions about the top tasks. That's the funny thing. Whatever I'm giving talks or all, if there's ever questions coming back from, it's what about the tiny tasks? Nobody cares about the crucial stuff uh, in, in the vast majority of environments. And that shows the lopsided focus of government in, in so many years, that it's not focused on what really matters to people and making it easier uh, in, in the process. So if, if you've got those low level tasks, well, at least you can simplify and bring them from 50 pages down to uh, two or three questions. You can at least uh, uh, focus on getting rid of the 95% of the content that government tends to write that that is of no real use to anybody uh, in, in the process. So even if you're dealing with a, a task down the list, you can radically simplify the environment and get rid of the, the, the less important stuff uh, that, that, that doesn't matter uh, to people in that process. That's great. Thank you. Um, the next question is, can you give a brief overview of the method you use to identify the top tasks in your example? Um, you alluded to the large effort it took. Yeah, I, and I cover, I kind of answered that, Andre, in the, in the previous question of, you know, it's a big, uh, you know, when we did it uh, in the, the health environment, it, it took it took about 
uh, 12 weeks uh, to actually do or, or more. So that we had hundreds of people involved. You know, it was a big consensual process within the organization with doctors and nurses and managers and uh, coming together, looking at the data, uh, patients and lots of feedback to really define, well, what is, you know, in dealing with health, what really matters? So we, we developed that consensually, that, so to speak, task ecosystem when we said, okay, are these all the things that really matter? Causes and conditions, prognosis, check symptoms, what to do based on condition, where to go for help, all the stuff that, that, that might really matter in dealing with your health. So we got that agreement internally and that was a long uh, process. Um, and then we went out to the citizens. We got uh, several thousand uh, citizens, both citizens and doctors. We got we got the medical professionals to vote as well, and we got the, so that we could compare the two groups. And we got the data then that allowed us to move forward with evidence. There's two ways we can go ahead in in this digital world. We can go ahead with evidence, and if we have evidence and says. Well, this is what people want because this vote, etc. And if we do it this way, we get an 80% success rate. If we do it this way, we get a 40% success rate. We can go forward with evidence or we can go forward with opinion. You know, and if we go forward with opinion, we're not going to get anywhere. We're, we're going to be uh, the opinion of the most senior manager or whatever. And, and often, as I'm sure you know from experience, that's not often the best opinion that really understands digital. Opinion driven digital strategies run into the mud and, 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 and go through a crisis within every two or three years. Data driven. Uh, based on actual customer experience, are much more likely to deliver value, value to everybody, to the department, to the citizens, to the business, to whoever's actually depending. So which way do we want to go? Do we want to go to a data-driven way or do we want to stay in the old model of opinion? I know some people are listening to this and saying, well, they have no choice. But in some organizations, there is a choice. And if we have that opportunity for a choice, let's shift to the data-driven model uh, based on actual evidence of the citizen and the customer experience. All right, we have another question. These are great questions, so keep oh. coming in. Um, so the next one says, as someone who is an implementer, not a decision maker, what can I do to get my state agency to focus on tasks strategically? Well, you, you could start by doing very simple measurements. You know, it's not that expensive to measure people. We, we can use um, Google Hangouts or Skype or GoToMeeting or WebEx. Remote measurement is actually more powerful than, than measurement in a lab because it's less disruptive. It's less likely, you're more likely to get normal behavior. So you could create a situation like the hourly forecast and say, look, when we tested this, uh, this way, um, only 25% of people found the hourly forecast. But when we moved it up near the top and, 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 and changed its name, 94% of people. So if you can start talking the language of metrics rather than the language of content, and you, you, you do guerrilla testing or whatever, and you find you know, uh, a way, you've got to find a way to find the evidence that somehow sh shows before and after. You got to say before it was this, and that has a number, and that represented a 50% failure rate. After we made this change, it went up to a 90% success rate. If we want to get the change, we've got to change the conversation. We won't change the conversation around, I think you should write it this way, I think you should write, because that's just opinion. And you're always going to be fighting a war of attrition if you're fighting opinion. But if you've got data that says, if we write the content this way, we've got a 40% success rate. If we write the content this way, we've got an 80% success rate. I mean, people don't want to fail. You know, in, and, and if they question and they say, well, I don't believe your data. Well, they say, let's run a bigger test. You know, they, they, you know that there is a way to measure this. So I would say find a way to measure the actual customer experience and show where the customer has problems, go back and, and say, listen, if we made these changes, we believe we could we could reduce that failure rate very substantially. Great, that's very important. Thank you. Um, our next question says, "What are the hardest parts for teams to grasp when doing top tasks for the first time?" 
And they had a second question, where have you seen the top task processes go wrong? Yeah, I think um, I think the, the, often the hardest is what is a task? Sometimes it's the most basic that because every oh they say oh a task is only you know a system, but checking weather updates that's a task. You know they say oh we've just got information. Everything checking symptoms is a task. You know reading up about prognosis of a disease that's a task. That a task is something somebody comes to do. So people are driven there. So really getting this agreement of this common agreement of what are the tasks, what are the, like a task is not search, even though technically that is it, but that's a kind of a generic activity. The tasks are more, you know, uh, file a return, you know, or get my refund, the refunds, they're the task. Now you might search to get those, you might navigate to get, so the, the, the tasks are not to use the navigation or use the search engine. The task is to pay my taxes or check, do I have this disease? I've got these symptoms. What could that be? What, what could they be symptoms of? So get building up that consensus internally about you know, what it is. And if you don't involve a broad spectrum of your organization, you're never really gonna make this successful. So where I've seen it fail a lot is where it's done within a narrow team and then they present the results and the wider organization says, well, I wasn't involved in that, you know, that's not, you know, you didn't talk to me in the process. So you might get your tasks identified quickly, but you won't get the buy-in uh, from, from the organization. So that, you're not bringing enough people along on the journey. Most of this is actually a change management process. Like 80% you're doing your top task, 80% or 70% of your time is actually spent talking to people in your organization, talking to doctors, talking to nurses, talking to getting them to, oh, you know, we're doing this and we're changing because usually it's a change in perspective that it's a process. So not bringing enough of people on board is um, a major reason why it fails. Another is it's just seen as another little component of navigation. You don't really, this changes the entire website. So this is a model for the entire website. It's not just adding another little snippet, another little area in the in the bottom right. It's a it's a total overhaul of every single thing that you have. So everything gets found. It's just that the tiny tasks are at level four or level five in the structure. The top tasks are at level one. So it's a prioritization model for everything, making sure that the top tasks get on top. But if you're just going to use it to add on to the already existing structure, you might as well not use it at all because you'll only make things even more confusing uh, in, in the process. Thank you. Um, one last question we have at the moment is, what is your opinion of the use of frequently asked questions? Oh. I'm phasing it out, but many of our clients love them. Well, I've never met anybody in a test that loves frequently asked questions. So if you, you know, if you have, if you want to, when is my refund? I mean, isn't it much better to have a link called refunds rather than frequently asked questions? I mean, how do people know? So frequently asked questions are a terrible old 1970s model of information organization. If they're so frequently asked, why aren't they in the structure? If everybody's asking about price, shouldn't you put that in, in the navigation? Uh, top tasks are the frequently asked questions. You know, so if you're at a municipality and people want to know about the libraries and people want to know about the schools and people want to know about the roads, I mean, do you put them behind frequently asked questions or do you create an architecture that says libraries, schools, roads? If these are the top things, these are, and then you figure out the top things under. You know, frequently asked questions are just like resources or tools. How, they're, they're like a lucky bag. Uh, in the vast majority, we've watched thousands and thousands of people use websites. They're a desperate last point. If you've got customers asking uh, to keep the frequently asked questions, you must have an appalling website to begin with because they would never be looking for them if the, if the most important stuff was immediately available, which it should be uh, in, in the information architecture. That's great. Let me check and see if we have any last questions. Um, while we're giving people a minute or two to see if they have any um, anything else they want to add, are there any you know last um, 
parting thoughts for us in the well, year? I think, I think it's a, you know, things are getting better. We may look back and think in, in, in frustration, et cetera. But I mean, there, there is, you know, a, 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 a general movement of improvement. And I think with this, these new policies towards mobile, this is a great opportunity to really focus, you know, because as I said, if it's impatient in, on desktop, it's 10 times in, more impatient in mobile. So mobile is a perfect top task. I mean, that's what the app concept is about. It's, it's, it's a task, it's a doable, a, immediately doable sort of things. So, so you should use mobile not to, you know, port your old website on uh, onto mobile, but use use the the movement towards the smartphone and mobile to really rethink a, a root and branch rethink of what is it that truly matters to our citizens and our businesses out there, and how do we deliver those things faster and easier? So use mobile as a as a strategic review of the core purpose of why we exist as government in, in the digital realm. Great. We have a, a lively discussion going on in the chat box around FAQs. So I'm just oh, okay. scanning that to see um, if there's any questions outside of FAQs. Um, there, there was a question around the frequently asked question. So are you saying that we should no longer use FAQs on our pages? Well, if you had a good structure, yes, I, that's what I'm saying. If you had a good structure, it would say what the FAQs, it would, it would unpack. And then the le less frequently asked questions would be somewhere lower in the structure. So if you, had a, if you had a good information architecture, that would immediately tell people uh, it's pricing, it's installation, it's troubleshooting. Do, do you want to download the software? How much does this cost? How much does this university cost? Core uh, course cost? Oh, it's thirty-two thousand dollars plus these plus accommodation, etc. You 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 take out. You know, this FAQs was used in the 70s and 80s before we had information architect. Before we had design. Then the best websites created a structure, which allowed people to to choose the most in what they actually uh, needed needed to do uh, in in the process so really focus on identifying those top tasks identifying those core things and you build your your architecture you build your 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 web your digital your your mobile environment about making those get a benefit you know how to how to apply for a benefit it'd be great if you went to vets.com we know, knew the top task was apply for a benefit and immediately you could start applying rather than seeing pictures of people, you know, an immediate, and then it says, here's the four things, most important things you need to know, but, but rather than hiding that behind a frequently asked question. Great. Um, and just to give a little space for the, um, the other side of the argument, what would you say to someone who was saying about FAQs that they help extract the specific question um, from the often many pages of content and then are thus relieving the user from the burden of scanning for them. Well, actually, a question is a terrible thing to scan. Now, certainly, uh, the, the idea of simplifying content of you know, that that waste bringing it down from you know two hundred and fifty words to twelve words. Actually, sent uh, questions are terrible for web scanning because the essence of them. The essence of the information is usually at the end of the question. So you're beginning, are there any blah? So questions are really bad web content because they don't, they don't have the essence. So instead of, are there any certain conditions to install this product? Why not call it installation? You can get rid of all the are there any, etc. So stripping it back even further and getting to the essence of the thing that the person wants to do is is often uh, the 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 better way to go. But yes, if if it's a question versus a two hundred page PDF, that's an improvement. Yeah, but we can do so much better, you know, than you know the monstrosities of 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 the PDF land. Sure, that's that, that's an improvement on that. But getting even tighter and focused on what does the person want to do? Price, it's $32. How much does it cost? You know, a passport renewal. You don't need to say how much does it cost to renew a passport. You just say passport renewal, $122. That's all you need. That's all the customer needs. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Jerry. Oh. I see we're at time and I just wanna um, thank everyone for joining us today and for the lively discussion in our chat box. It's been really fun to, to watch the questions go back and forth. Um, so just a few housekeeping items at the end before we all leave. Um, I just wanna let everyone know that if you have any additional questions, feel free to send them to the DGU team and we will follow up. And also the DGU team put a link to the event evaluation in the YouTube chat box. So please take a moment and give them your feedback about today's event. Um, and they'll also send the evaluation via email along with the slides, the video, and any other relevant resources. So Jerry, I just wanna thank you again. This has been wonderful. And we hope to see you all again soon. Okay, thanks Andrea. Thanks everyone for listening. Okay, bye now. Bye.